Please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Claudia Moreno, assistant professor at uh, the University of Washington in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics. She will be giving a talk titled, Better Together, Insights into the Clustering of Ion Channels. Welcome, Claudia. Thank you so much. Let's see, okay, this is, let's see how this goes because I have two different pointers. So thank you so much to the organizers for the invitation and thank you everyone for hanging around after the lunch break. So I'll do my best to keep you awake. Uh, and today I will show you how we have used super resolution microscopy, electrophysiology and biophysics to study the way ion channels organize. And uh, in the other uh, part of the talk, I will tell you a little bit about the things we are doing in my lab right now, uh, a lab that I just launched seven months ago in the Department of uh, Physiology and Biophysics. So super resolution microscopy has changed the way we see proteins and ion channels are not the exception. Before when we look into the organization of ion channels and we look at them through regular epifluorescence microscopes, we saw images that looked like this. So a diffuse ring around the cell that gave the impression that ion channels organize in a homogeneous uh, way in the plasma membrane. And if we use total internal uh, reflection microscopy, that is a technique that allows you to restrict the illumination to a very thin layer close to the plasma membrane, you would see something like this. So now ion channels look more heterogeneous. Uh, but it, due to the diffraction limit of this technique, it was impossible for us to know if inside one of these uh, puncta uh, there were one or more ion channels. So it wasn't until the development of super resolution microscopy that we could really go and look how ion channels organized. And we went from images that look like this to images that look like this. So a highly resolved image with a resolution uh, close to 20 uh, nanometers that show us that in fact ion channels organize uh, packed into clusters as I show here in this example. So clusters of different sizes that when we quantified we saw a wide range of uh, cluster size. So the question was is there any functionality behind the clustering of ion channels? And we started to study different ion channels and the more channels we studied, the more it looked like when talking about uh, ion channels, clustering seems the rule. So we have studied, and these are just uh, some examples, uh, and we have observed organization in clusters for BK channels, 3B4, L-type calcium channels, regardless of the cell type. And all of them show a wide range of uh, cluster size. So the fact that we saw clustering in almost any channel we tested uh, brought the idea that probably clustering was just a simple organization that ion channels adapt into the lipid environment of the plasma membrane. And in fact, uh, recently we developed a mathematical model to see how the organization of channels is when you randomly insert and remove channels into the plasma membrane. And this is what you're gonna see in this simulation in the next slide. So the blue mask represents the plasma membrane and those little uh, yellow spots that you are seeing there are ion channels that are being uh, stochastically inserted and removed from the plasma membrane. And you see that by the end of the simulation, we get a distribution, like a cluster distribution, that looks very similar to what we uh, have observed experimentally. So uh, this suggested that yes, probably clustering is a conformation, an organization that uh, is adapted by proteins just by being immersed in the, in the lipid environment. But uh, there is a particular case that I'm gonna talk today in which we have tested that clustering has a function. And this is the case of L-type calcium channels. L-type calcium channels are voltage-gated channels that are expressed in multiple excitable cells. And I'm gonna show you the evidence that led us to propose a model that inside these clusters, these channels are undergoing a functional interaction that changes the way these channels uh, operate. So the first question we wanted to, to answer is, are the channels inside these clusters touching each other? So to answer this, we use a, an approach called a bimolecular and complementation fluorescence 
in which basically you have a fluorescent yellow protein, in this case uh, the venous protein. You split that in two halves, and these two halves are non-fluorescent. You tag one of these halves to one of your channels, then you express the channels in, the, in a heterologous system, and if you activate the channels and at some point they get interacting physically, you are gonna have a reconstitution of your fluorescent protein, and then you will have uh, an increase in the fluorescence. So here I'm gonna show you how the experiment actually looks. So what you are seeing here is the footprint of a cell transfected with these constructs. Uh, we are looking in total internal reflection microscopy, so we are seeing just uh, very close to the plasma membrane. And then we are opening the channels with voltage steps to see if opening the channels make them to interact. And as you can see in the first condition that we tested, uh, it was using uh, barium in the extracellular solution, which these channels are permeable to, uh, we didn't see any increase in the interaction. So the, the fluorescence looks uh, almost uh, the same. But when we did a, the same experiment using calcium in the extracellular solution, so we saw a nice increase when we started opening the channels. So this suggests that now the channels started to interact physically, and these are the quantifications uh, for that. And uh, also, this experiment told us that this uh, process was calcium dependent. So we went to, to study deeper the calcium dependence of, of this process. And it is known that these channels are regulated by a protein called calcium calmodulin. And we demonstrated that in fact, calcium calmodulin was mediating this physical interaction between the L-type calcium channels. So once again, you have here a control cell in calcium solution. We open the channels. Now calcium gets into the cell, and we started seeing an increase in the fluorescence reconstitution, so channels are touching. But this physical interaction goes away when we use either a, a peptide that inhibits calcium calmodulin or a dominant negative of calcium calmodulin that is unable to bind calcium. So those uh, two things are able to abolish completely uh, the interactions between the channels. So okay, inside the cluster, the channels are touching each other, but what about the function? Does it change the function of the channels, the fact that they are touching? And to answer this question, we use um, a, an optogenetic tool called a cryptochrome system in which you have two components. You again fuse one of them to each channel, and then when you illuminate with blue light, now the two proteins have a conformational change and the affinity for each other increases, so they get together and force the channels to interact. So what happens with the function? We measure the function of the channels by electrophysiology, so basically you are measuring the current flowing through the channels, and these downward um, traces indicate how much, channel, how much current is flowing uh, through the channel, so how much calcium we are getting into the cell. And you can see that in white, we have uh, an amount of current entering the cell, and this goes up after we force the channels to interact. So basically forcing the channels to interact is increasing the amount of calcium that the channels are letting in into the cell. And physiologically, this has different effects that we have evaluated in different cells, but I'm gonna show you an example in hippocampal neurons where getting more calcium in uh, results in an increase in the firing rate of the neurons. And so uh, we use the same approach with the cryptochrome system, but this time in hippocampal neurons, and then you can see how a cell, this cell is firing spontaneously action potentials, and after we illuminate with blue light and force the channels to interact, there is a significant increase in the firing rate. So uh, all this data together uh, brought us to propose this model in which we think that L-type calcium channels are openly, opening stochastically at low um, potentials, but then when there is enough calcium to get activated calmodulin, calmodulin binds specifically to a domain of the C-terminus of the channel called the pre-IQ domain. So I didn't show that data, but that's something that we also uh, determined. And then 
can moduling bridges an interaction between the channels and this physical interaction results into an increase in the open probability of the channels. So now the channels open at the same time, they open for longer times, and you get more calcium into the cell, regulating the excitability of, of the cell. So here, uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to keep talking about L-type calcium channels, but in a different context, and is more related with the things I'm doing right now in the lab. So the main questions uh, we are trying to answer is, what are the mechanisms underlying the dysfunction of the heart's pacemaker during aging? And so let me tell you a little bit about the pacemaker, for the ones that are not familiar with this. Uh, tissue, so the cardiac pacemaker is an specialized and a small tissue uh, of the heart that has the ability to uh, fire spontaneously action potentials and generate that electrical spark that initiates heart contraction. So the human heart beats around 100,000 times a day and near 2.5 billion times in an average lifetime. And each single heartbeat originates right here, on top of the right atrium in this small region called the sinoatrial node, or also known as the natural uh, pacemaker of the heart. So this cycle goes over and over again, since the moment the heart is formed in the embryo until the moment we die. So this is a very reliable uh, tissue, but unfortunately is not exempt of the deleterious effects of aging. So aging causes a decrease in the pacemaking rate that is in fact responsible for the decrease in the maximum heart rate that every person experiences as we age. And in some people, uh, this reduction is so drastic that it, gets, uh, it leads to the onset of a series of diseases known as sick sinus syndrome. This disease is responsible for 50% of the more than 200,000 artificial pacemakers that are implanted annually only in the US. So understanding the mechanisms uh, behind this is important. What's happening in the pacemaker cells that they are uh, failing to work as when we are young. And to understand what's happening at the cellular uh, level, I need to bring you on a trip inside a, a pacemaker cell to show you how the automaticity of the node uh, works. So this is a diagram of a pacemaker cell. So here we have the plasma membrane, sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is the electrical signature of the pacemaker, the action potential. And we're going to go through all of these phases, and I'm going to start populating here the most important proteins that, or, uh, that participate. And this um, pacemaker automaticity um, depends on proteins that are located both at the plasma membrane and also in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we will start here in the early diastolic depolarization, that is the more hyperpolarized phase. And this is, is low rate is sustained mainly by the opening of HCM4 channels that are very peculiar channels that have the ability to open at these hyperpolarized voltages. And also by the release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum uh, through ryanodine receptors. Then, as we start depolarizing the membrane potential, we move to the late diastolic depolarization. And here we start talking about uh, L-type calcium channels again. So we have the CAB 1.3 channel uh, contributing to this uh, depolarization, also members of the T-type and the sodium calcium exchanger. We reach the threshold, then the action potential is fired, and a difference to um, the people that are familiar with ventricular cardiomyocytes, here in the pacemaker, the action potential spike is completely sustained by calcium. In ventricular cardiomyocytes, is by sodium. So who is responsible for that? Again, L-type calcium channels, both 1.2 and 1.3. So uh, these are, are mainly the channels that we, we study. So once this... Uh, conductances start to inactivate and also potassium channels start to open, then we have the repolarization of the action potential and the cycle starts over again. Okay, so uh, as you can see, there is a fine balance here of uh, flowing of 
ions between these two compartments. So that's why uh, we are so interested in evaluating how aging is affecting the way all these ion channels organize. And we are particularly interested in linking organization, function, and regulation of these ion channels and understanding how aging is modulating all this. So uh, I'm going to start just uh, giving you some uh, preliminary data that we have so far. And the most striking fact that we have found is a big reduction in the L-type calcium current in old animals. So again, here you are seeing these uh, downward uh, deflections are how much calcium is getting into the cell when you activate uh, the, the cells with voltage. So you see in young animals, we have a big entrance of calcium, and in red, we have old animals with a strong reduction in the L-type calcium channel. So orange and blue are just uh, traces of the remnant con uh, current under the application of a blocker that blocks specifically L-type calcium channels. And it's just to show that L-type calcium channels are the main source of calcium entry here. And the quantification of these uh, currents uh, show, uh, again, that there is a big reduction here in the old animals of these components. So the most obvious uh, thing to test first was changes in expression of the channels. So are old animals expressing less uh, amount of protein, but um, to our surprise, we didn't find any reduction in the expression of the protein. In fact, it looks like it's the opposite that is increasing. And as we know that clustering is so important for these channels to interact, we started looking in how these channels are arranging at the plasma membrane. So first, we wanted to see if uh, both the CAV1.3 and the CAV1.2 were organizing in clusters in the pacemakers. And as you can see here, uh, for both channels, so this is the 1.3 and the 1.2, they, they, they show this nicely uh, cluster. Uh, but interestingly, when we look in comparing young versus old animals, uh, in the young animals, we saw the classical clustering of the channels, but in the old ones, we saw a completely a deorganization and the clustering of the channels. So what's happening here? Uh, could be many things that we are evaluating right now. Are there problems in the trafficking of the channels? Are there are, are problems in the scaffolding that is keeping these clusters together? Or there is a big change in the turnover of the channels? So all these things are open questions that we are starting to test now and that I hope to have more answers next year when I, I come back. Uh, but uh, there is a, a, a last point that I want to touch here, and it's related with the beauty of the pacemaker, and is not only the re reliability of this tissue, when you think a tissue that starts just, you know, like operating over and over again for the whole life, but also how uh, plastic and adaptable it is. Because as you can think, as animals, we really need to be able to adapt our heart rate when we are in different situations. And that's the case, um, for example, of this iguana here, where it's resting nicely on the beach until danger arrives. happening inside the pacemaker of that poor iguana when it's trying to escape uh, the snakes? And the answer is adrenaline, the fight or flight response that allows us to respond to dangerous situations. And that is so powerful that even some of you could feel an arousal of adrenaline just by watching at this video. <laughs> Probably it wasn't that bad as my four years old when she saw me this morning rehearsing the <laughs> the presentation and she saw the video, but probably you could still feel it. So what's happening inside the cells is, uh, is this. So pacemaker cells have beta adrenergic receptors. It, they have two different types, beta-1 and beta-2 adrenergic receptors, that they activate the production of, of cyclic AMP under the presence of uh, adrenaline. And then uh, there is an activation of PKA and phosphorylation of many of the 
ion channels that I show you are important for the pacemaking. And this uh, is what allows the cell to enhance the activity of all these proteins and go from a resting heart rate into an accelerated heart rate. So the way uh, beta-adrenergic receptors communicate and are able to regulate all these uh, channels, we are specifically interested at this point to L-type calcium channels, uh, depends a lot in the proximity of these proteins. So I want you to think that Inside the cell, we have all these proteins that are carefully arranged to talk to each other. And we are interested to know what's happening during aging, if it's somehow aging altering the way these proteins communicate and organize in these special microdomains. And that's the reason because the cells start being you know, like less, less functional. So we have started to test, we have started to test proximity of uh, these components using a, an approach that is called proximity ligation assay in which basically you have your two proteins of interest, you recognize them with primary antibodies, and then you have these secondary special antibodies that have an oligonucleotide, that if your proteins happen to be closer than 40 nanometers, you can do a ligation reaction here, and then you perform basically a PCR on top of your proteins, you amplify these oligos and these uh, DNA probes, have uh, fluorescent markers, so you end up with a bright fluorescent spot on top of the proteins that are close. And so this is an image, an inverted uh, fluorescence image, in which we are detecting the proximity between CAV1.2 and beta-1 adrenergic receptor in young and an, in old animals. And in this case, we didn't see a big change in the in the proximity, but when we evaluated the proximity between the CAV1.2 and the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, we saw a big reduction in the proximity of these proteins. So this is the quantification for, for that data. And so this is suggesting that, in fact, there are many things going on during aging in terms of how proteins and, uh, organize at the plasma membrane, how, how they cluster and how they arrange relative to other proteins that are important for their modulation. And I'm just gonna close uh, here saying that we are also interested in looking at this tissue beyond the cell level. And the reason because we want to do that is because the pacemaker has a beautiful architecture that is very important for its function. So this is an image of a clear uh, pacemaker uh, tissue from a mouse heart, which was immunostained against the HCM4 channel. So everything that you see in cyan is uh, pacemaker cells. And then you can see here, this is what is called the head of the pacemaker, and this is the tail. And here in the head is where we have the cells that uh, beat the fastest. So these are the leading pacemaker cells, uh, cells that initiate uh, the, the electrical signal. And then this signal spreads through the whole pacemaker and then through the atria. And it's, there are a few reports that say that there is, during aging, a de decentralization of this lead pacemaker to uh, diverse regions here in the tail. So we have started to look into what happens in, term, in terms of the architecture of the pacemaker. And as you can see, this is an example of an old um, pacemaker cell, and you see that now we have uh, lost completely this nice packed uh, head, and there is also a spread of cells in different uh, places. So we are interested in, ad in addressing many questions about what's happening at the whole tissue level, and we are planning to incorporate uh, single cell sequencing, in situ hybridization, and other techniques that allow us to see uh, changes in gene expression, changes in protein expression, and also innervation and vascularization of the pacemaker. And so we are seeking for collaborators because we know here there are many people uh, using really powerful approaches to study the brain, and we want to bring some of those to the heart. So I just um, want to thank everyone that uh, has helped in the lab, also collaborators, and especially Oscar Vivas, who is also a new PI at PBIO and who has uh, been closely collaborating with us in all the architectural and innovation uh, project of the pacemaker. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Claudia. We have time for a few questions. If you'd raise your hand, please. Okay, I think we'll do this one in front first. Beautiful work. Oh, thank you so much. Good job, Claudia. <laughs> So a couple of things, I have too many questions, but let's try to summarize in one that called my attention. So when you do the, um, the dimerization induced by light, I mean, when you increase actually the enteocalcin, uh, we observe that the current is larger. However, the calcium dependent inactivation seems to be slower, which is kind of contradictory when we think we know what happened there. What I wonder is, do you have any observation that how it's possible with high calcium you have slower calcium dependent inactivation? We, we don't know. We didn't find any significant difference when we quantify multiple cells in the, in the inactivation of the channels. You I agree that it, it, in that example, uh -huh. it, and in a couple of cells, it looks slower. We did more, more experiments, try to look, you know, like, uh, pair pulses to test differences in inactivation. But uh, yeah, that's something that we, we didn't explore completely. But I have a second question, if you, if you allow me, in relation to PKA or the phosphorylation. Mm -hmm. So is there any indication that the phosphorylation of the channel can modify the gating? Because we know the gating change with the, in single channels. Mm -hmm. Now in this condition, the combination calcium plus PKA phosphorylation how does those guys look like? Yeah, that's a that's very interesting question. We, we have seen that we, we performed some experiments doing the split venous um, approach and activating PKA, and then we saw increases in the, in the interaction of the channels. And um, actually, Rosie Dixon, who was a postdoc that collaborated with me in this project, and, and she works now uh, in UC Davis, she recently published a paper showing that when you activate um, the cardiomyocytes with isoproterenol, mm -hmm. and you get an increase in the cluster size and in the coupling of the channels. So it, she hasn't tested yet mutants for the phosphorylation sites that we know are important in the, in the L-type calcium channel, but definitely there, there is a role there in PKA. That is, that is phosphatase dependent? So you can be reversible by phosphatases? I think that we haven't tested that, but it would, it would be cool to do it. But Thank you. Wonderful job. Thank, Thank you. you. There's a question in the back, I believe. I was wondering if you observed any differences with like sedentary versus active older pacemaker cells in either clustering or protein expression? We haven't done that. So we, now we are just, uh, we have tested you know, when we work in isolated cells, we use the whole node, so uh, we haven't isolated like the active pacemaker cells from the lead. And that's, some, that's an approach that we really want to, to explore because we definitely think that the cellular heterogeneity in this tissue is, is very important, and that's something that we really want to, to keep an eye on. Thank you. There's a question up there. Hi, Claudia. Thank you so much. That was very cool. Um, so I'm wondering, in your calcium channel touching experiment, is there any possibility that those uh, reporter fluorescent proteins had any level of uh, physical interaction um, that might stabilize the open conformation of those calcium channels? Yes. That's, that's a really, really nice point. I didn't show those experiments here, but actually, yes, they do. The answer, the answer is yes. Uh, once you reconstitute the fluorescent protein, uh, they keep, the, the, the protein is re reconstituted, so it's not a way to go back. And we performed some, some experiments um, inducing the, the reconstitution, and then we recorded the calcium activity for up to 10 seconds after we saw the reconstitution. And clearly you can see that they keep uh, uh, cooperatively uh, coupled for a long time. And we did also some FRET experiments to see that actually that mechanisms of coupling lasts for longer than 
what actually the current lasts. So we call that like a molecular mechanisms of a memory. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I think we'll take one more question in the front here. That was a great talk, thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have any hypotheses, or I have two questions, any hypotheses on the role of like the cytoskeleton or the organization of the membrane on either the clustering or the activity of the L-type calcium channels? And the second uh, question is probably more important, did the iguana make it? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a, the very important one. First, uh, the first question. Um, the microtubules uh, are known to have an important role in trafficking and directing the L-type calcium channels, especially in ventricular cardiomyocytes in T-tubules. Uh, pacemaker cells look di very different from a ventricular cardiomyocytes. They don't have T-tubules. And I didn't show that part of the story, but we are starting to explore uh, more the role of a scaffolding protein called BIN1 that is important for forming the tubules and it forms some prototubules in pacemaker cells. And this protein anchors microtubules. So we think definitely uh, the cytoskeleton is playing a role there in, in either delivering them to the right side or keeping them there. So we, we still don't know, but yeah, that's something we, we, we want to explore. And the second one, yes. They wanna made it. <laughs> I had to show my kid the video until the end so she could sleep. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you again, Claudia. Thank you so much.